this storm has caused confusion and delay. You have caused confusion and delay. No, I think you are face prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy is just the ultimate farm. Daisy, Daisy is just the ultimate farm. Your impatience has caused confusion and delay. This storm has caused confusion and delay. You are causing confusion and delay. You are causing confusion and and you can't even drive. I can. Are you stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. Bit grey today. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another Deepest Law. We are continuing with the Adam Curtis series. Uh, we're going to be finishing off an ocean apart today, but. We're actually going to set it up by dipping into a later series, which is called Pandora's Box. So this is uh, actually going to be the first time that we hear Adam Curtis's voice. <laughs> um, so we'll uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, let us, uh, first of all, remind everybody, do buy my courses at the Academic Agency. That ne'er-do-well car mechanic still hasn't, he still hasn't fixed the car. So... Uh, if he hasn't sorted that out by end of play tomorrow, I'm going to play hell. I'm going to get on that blower. I'm going to be like, Oi, you, car mechanic, you can come around here with your spanner, but if you don't actually fix the car, no, no. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, do buy my courses, the academic agency, especially the best selling course there, the Trivium. There's a lot of great information and history in this book, and even a mystery trick that you can learn at the end. So take it from me, Kenneth Michael Benbow Blake. This is a great book to read, so pick it up at your local library now. All right, so um, now th these two uh, documentaries we're going to look at today the um the final one uh the seventh episode of an ocean apart um finishes off the story of the uk us relationship with the thatcher reagan years and when there's a lot of stuff about folk the falklands and um things like that in there okay but there's quite a lot of uh interesting stuff in the Pandora's Box episode about Thatcher, um, which is all about the economic models that were used uh, during it. Now, it's a bit more kind of domestic British focus, but uh, I actually think it's worth watching that one first uh, because it kind of gives a lot of uh, context, I think, to what was actually going on in the country, and just how buggered it was, really. Um after the war and indeed right through the 60s 70s and arguably right into the 80s uh, lots of interesting things in here so uh, without further ado i'm going to start now i may skip ahead at different bits as i have done before so i can get both of them in within the two hours um they'll be talking from me as well of course but let's make a start on uh this is the league of gentlemen uh from pandora's box and right out of the gate, I'll say that you'll notice the, uh, you know, David Dimbleby, who we've been, uh, who's been our kind of steady, firm host uh, of Oceans Apart. Um, it's it's Curtis himself. And uh, Curtis's style is always narration over archival footage. That's his whole deal. But the full, what I would describe as Curtis formula is still not fully 
uh, fleshed here by Pandora's box because there are still talking heads, there are still interviewees. Uh, there is even some times where you hear Curtis, an interviewer who I assume is Curtis, asking the talking heads questions. So there is still a little bit more. Uh, I would say Pandora's Box is a transitional series from the more conventional format of Oceans Apart to um, the fully fleshed out Curtis style, which I, I would say comes in uh, 1995 with a with with a Living Dead. All right, let's uh, make a start then. For the last 30 years, politicians in Britain have tried to build a new prosperity. They wanted to make an old nation. I should mention, by the way, this was made in 1992. So when he says 30 years, he's talking about, roughly speaking, 1962 to 1992. Okay. That had fallen behind in the world, recapture the glories of its past. They turned for help to what they believed was a science of money. One after another, Labour and Conservative governments became convinced that if they followed what they thought were a set of scientific laws, the economy would grow faster. The perceived tide of decline could be reversed. Classic 80s yuppies here. But instead of restoring the country's fortunes, the economic experiments failed to halt Britain's relative decline. This is the odd story of how politicians came to believe there was a technical way to make Britain great again. It's interesting, by the way, that he, he uses the refrain throughout this, make Britain great again, given, you know, now you'd think make America great again as a, as a Trump slogan, but here he is talking uh, about making Britain great again. And um, there's some, ve I mean, there's some really enduring Curtis themes in this one. He is obsessed, I would say, Curtis, with um, kind of managerial attempts technocratic managerial attempts to uh, try to find these scientific or rational solutions to human problems and um for this reason i think you know this is one of the reasons i wanted to do this because uh, that obsession of courtesies i think goes to the heart of a lot of our a lot of the ills that we've had uh, really since uh well since the turn of the 20th century, you could argue, or maybe even since the 19th century, um, you know, see prophets of doom for more. But uh, yeah, let's let's continue. Ten years ago, one car in every three bought in Sweden was British. Today, we've less than 10%. Now that's this is the voice of Alan Wicker, by the way, for the younger viewers in the chat it's alan wicker he used to present a show called wicker's world and he had this uh really unusual voice so there's a there's a terrific wicker's world by the way looking at uh san francisco in the 1960s where he goes there and sees the hippies and so on uh well worth a watch um i th i think i don't think i did a stream on it but i may have shared it once or twice many years ago all right a sad story, but let's take a quick sample here on this bridge in central Stockholm and see just what the Swedes are driving. Well, there's a Swedish Volvo, a Swedish Saab. That is another Swedish Volvo over there, a Swedish Volvo. One after another, other European countries who we were used to thinking of nice guys, but 
poorer, uh, began to get within shouting distance of us and passing. It's like being in a sailing race and seeing people you didn't think were good enough or hadn't scraped the bottoms of their boat well enough, nevertheless overhauling you. A German Ford truck, an English Zephyr. Congratulations, Ford, a Mercedes-Benz. People began insistently to ask if they can once get on a growth path of that steepness. Won't they soon overtake us properly? And a Volkswagen. Our leaders today, by the way, are still absolutely obsessed with the notion of growth. Um, I think Keir Starmer's slogan, one of his slogans in the current um, campaign for Labour is growth, growth, growth. <laughs> um, they've been obsessed with growth for many, for decades now. Um, and uh, th this is one of the things that I really think needs to change, by the way. I think this obsession with growth is one of the things that's, that's killing us, essentially. Well, in that lot, one British car. One Ford. What was holding Britain back, it was decided, was the old-fashioned idea that the civil servant's job was simply to keep the economy stable. In 1961, the Conservative government set up NEDI, the National Economic Development Council, in what had been a gentleman's club in Westminster. It was advised by young economists convinced they could make the economy grow much faster. Ah, oh, yes, this is my old room. A splendid room, isn't it? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry it's all boarded up, the windows there, because, you know, there's a balcony out there. As, as you know, the growth target of Neddy was 4% a year. But, and I had visions of myself uh, getting out onto that balcony and at the end of 1966 sort of proclaiming to the cheering crowds below, 4%, we've done it. Many of this generation of economists had been taught with the aid of a large machine worked by water. Now, I shared this on Twitter earlier on, and it's gone kind of like, I wouldn't say like viral, but I've seen, I, I passed it around the, my friends and Mises, and, uh, you know, I've seen it passed around and lots of people have commented on it. This blew my mind when I watched it earlier on. I cannot believe this machine existed and they used it to <laughs> do economic modeling and it's just, it's just mental. Built by Bill Phillips, an engineer turned economist, it has lain disused for years. That powers these two parts over here, which is where money, money can actually come into the economy. <laughs> the actual water flowing around is the money going through the economy. Yeah. That enabled you to illustrate, for instance, what would happen if you try to grow the... Who's, if you're in the chat, this guy is an Iranian, so just FYI economy pump more money into the economy for instance you could increase government expenditure and i mean i it's just i i cannot get my head around this machine actually being built and used in the london school of economics the fact that this exists is just it, it should show you how crazy these people are see what the effect of that is through the workings of the economy the interaction of all the variables on growth of course if the economy is very prone to imports people might simply spend their money to import foreign goods or if the economy is operating at a high level of activity then that would lead to inflation Neddy's economists did not have a new theory but they believed they could use existing techniques in a new way they saw themselves as followers of the economist Maynard Keynes. He had shown how to manage an economy by increasing or decreasing demand. I mean, it's just, <laughs> what, a, what a great single own from, you know, if you're an Austrian or Chicago guy or whatever, and you want to dunk on Keynesians, just show that clip of the bloody <laughs> water machine model. I still can't believe it. The problem was that every time you increased demand too much, imports flooded in and wages rose. But Neddy's economists were convinced they could control a boom. They would plan investment in industry and the government would hold inflation down. The bad old days of stop-go would be over. Now 1%, 1%, and what have we to bear? A lousy little 1%, and paradise is here. An extra little effort, and the country's gonna boom. Our plans for the future of Britain in the coming year are clear and comprehensive. We have accepted with enthusiasm the Neddy target of a 4% growth rate. 
and all our actions have been designed to achieve it. I can see someone in the chat saying that Curtis sounds young here. He was 37 years old when he made this. Um, so he was younger than me. I'm 40, 41. So he must have had quite a high, high voice when he was younger. But, uh, if you go back and listen to me when I was 37, I sound considerably younger than I am now as well. So there we are. This nation must not jog along. This nation must be inspired with the determination to achieve great things. Factory owner called his men and said, I'm confident. You'll rally to the challenge and produce that 1%. And up then spoke a worker, do our wages rise or what? And the boss said, most amusing, and sacked him on the spot. By 1963, the economist's promises seemed to be coming true. The conservatives had poured money into the economy, and sure enough, it had begun to grow. They had placed their bets on growth. They talked about it a lot. There was an announcement about it. Why? Now, now this guy, I would say, has got a great, uh, you know, really nice library. Love that leather chair. I love his kind of slightly debauched, uh, <laughs> debauched demeanor. Maybe this is something to aim aim towards in like, ten years' time or something. White papers, speeches, and all the rest. In our system of politics, when something important like that is put on the table by the government of the day, the opposition has to respond to it. My purpose tonight is to have a word with you about the future of Britain. The outstanding thing we ought to do, obviously, is to get up our economic strength, operating a national plan, a plan for steady, continuous, controlled production and expansion. Labour promised a national plan, run by a separate department of economic affairs. And what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong, eh? <laughs> George Brown. It would make Britain grow by a quarter in just six years. It was a seductive dream for a socialist party, for if the economists could produce this growth, then Labour's leaders would avoid what they had always thought inevitable, the battle to redistribute the country's wealth. Instead, there would be more for everyone. But it all depended on the economists' promises that they had the technical solutions to the politicians' problems. Look at the plans they all had. Where was that future then? Where was that? This is what we were all promised. What happened to it all? Where's my monorail? Where's my flying cars? Instead, what we've got is infinity Africans and everything going down the shitter. <laughs> what happened to all these promises that we were given, anyway? Growth. Then Labour's leaders would avoid what they had always thought inevitable, the battle to redistribute the country's wealth. Instead, there would be more for everyone. But it all depended on the economists' promises that they had the technical solutions to the politicians' problems. We saw ourselves as providing the politicians with a potential menu of outcomes but if the politicians would give us some indication then we could set the instruments in such a way as we could deliver reasonably enough give or take the various shocks that would occur in the economy the kind of outcomes that the politicians wanted <laughs> there's one basic fact Labour has a clear majority, we have a Labour government. But Labour had come to power just as the boom the Conservatives had begun was overheating. Imports were... Uh, now, I, I asked earlier on, what on earth does overheating mean? This is like Keynesian talk, which I've never quite understood. But uh, as it happens, I have an economist friend um, uh, uh, whose work I actually really recommend. He's got a good uh he's got a good podcast as well steve davis he said nice things about my book the defenders of liberty some years ago um i know him from the from the iea which is actually going to be talked about uh later on in this uh in this very documentary and he says that overheating means the level of economic activity is greater than can be sustained by the available resources at a given level of technology. The symptoms are rising prices and or shortages, particularly in labor markets, but also with the other factors of production. So that is 
the precise definition of what they mean when they say overheating. So thank you very much for that, Stephen. Flooding in and wages rising. This was the point when in the past a halt would have been called. But Labour were determined to press on. Mr Brown, Mr. Brown. Yes, yes, have you been discussing the economic situation this morning? We've been discussing the affairs... Labour had missed out a vital component from the plan, the economists told them. They should devalue the pound and so make Britain's exports cheaper. But in the politicians' eyes, devaluation would undermine precisely what they were trying to achieve, to make Britain great again. Wilson was a great one who believed in sterling. Sterling was the centre of everything, and he always said that uh, he would defend the pound and we'd have a place east of Suez, and it was a sort of nationalism of a kind. After that, all talk of devaluation by economists and everyone else was forbidden. I, I mean, th th this is really stupid, by the way, because um, the strength of a currency is not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes it's a good idea to let the value of the currency come down, okay? Because it means more people will buy your stuff. If, if the currency is strong, it means your goods are too expensive. But uh, Harold Wilson, I mean, this is like Thomas Sowell, basic economic stuff here. Harold Wilson, you know, through a kind of sense of pride, wanted the pound to be strong because it sounds good. <laughs> That's basically what I'm getting from this. Um, anyway, let's carry on. I personally used to do little sums on scraps of paper in my room in the DEA. When anyone opened the door, I would hastily put them into my drawer. There are millions of workers in this country who will never get fair play until you've got a decent incomes policy. Can't you get that into your head? By 1965, the boom was clearly out of control. Faced with inflation, the government tried to hold down wages and prices, but to no avail. It also faced repeated runs on the pound as foreign investors lost confidence in Labour's management of the economy. Now became a game between the politicians. Or it were an absolute disaster, by the way. Um, I mean, Wilson, I thought, on the foreign policy front with the Americans a couple of episodes back, or last episode, did, you know, he was not awful. Hit on the economy, on the economic front absolute disaster this, this wilson government uh, you know labor have only really been in power three times atley wilson and blair uh, there were you know there was callahan and there was a few other uh but really they've only been in power three times and this government here was a, a complete and utter disaster on on pretty much every single front um anyway let's let's carry on Politicians whose fortunes depended on it, and their economists, who had begun to realise the economy was now far beyond their control. They were being used. I think the moment I really realised it was a gimmick was when, after we'd finished work on it, and it was the summer, I think it was the summer of 1965, I hadn't very much to do, and so I decided I'd look at the details of the plan and see all the different measures, the things like the decision that you double expenditure on road building, for instance, and try and work out what effects these might have on the growth rate of the country. And I laboriously worked through making my best guesses and calculations, um, not having been particularly told to do this by anybody, and came up with the results. And they were well, well short of anything that might have produced uh, the 25 percent growth and I wandered along to my seniors and said hey look I've done this useful little exercise and they weren't in the least interested nothing to do with it at all I mean typical typical like no bureaucrat actually wants to solve any real problem so I'm not surprised you got that answer fight for the pound is on. After last week's depressing trade figures and the rise in the bank rate, after a weekend of growing speculation and three days of shoring up the pound in the foreign exchange market, Mr. Harold Wilson himself cried stop. What went wrong was that foreigners who hold the pound decided in unison that Britain was no longer to be trusted. There was a wave, there was a mood. And what the government sure. has done is to respond to the mood by producing something which demonstrates a will, 
to deflate this economy, which is bound to crush it, in my view. In other words, we're condemned to no growth. The attempt to plan growth had failed. Britain was left with little expansion and political disaster. What I love about this particular documentary is that literally it doesn't matter what the plan is, it doesn't matter how, what theories they have, you know, what school they're from, everything is a fucking disaster. <laughs> and I just love the way Curtis said, yes, and the plan failed. <laughs> it's just this year, everything ends in failure. It's uh, quite incredible. Most economists blamed it on the government's failure to devalue. Few asked whether the weakness of Britain's currency was really a symptom of something much deeper, far beyond the power of their techniques to deal with. A year later, the government bowed to the inevitable and devalued. But it was far too late. The economy had long ago come juddering to a stop. As a result of that experience, we had to abandon the notion tacitly and slowly, but abandon it all the same, that the planning apparatus itself was the unique and certain method of achieving the aim of faster growth. We still believed in faster growth, and we still, many of us, thought that it was attainable, but this particular path to its achievement was no longer key, was no longer essential, could no longer be relied upon. In the early 70s, many economists began to find they no longer understood how money behaved. <laughs> oh, it's just so... <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> just a great line. It's such a good line, I might have to listen to it again. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I enjoy that. It's just it's dead pan delivery. It was no longer essential, could no longer be relied upon. In the early 70s, many economists began to find they no longer understood how money behaved. <laughs> the new Conservative government under Edward Heath had tried what was called a dash for growth. They poured in money by liberalising credit and increasing public spending. For a moment, the economy boomed. Oh, what a surprise. I mean, oh, I, I hate to go back to my Ludwig von Mises, but come on, a sudden credit expansion is going to create a quick boom and then it's going to create... I mean, what could happen? What could happen, trade cycle people? Credit expansion followed by... Oh, isn't, I, I, I don't know. I'm just going to let him talk. But then the strangest thing happened. Prices and unemployment began to rise together. People called it stagflation. All a girl needs. 30p for a deck chair this week. Blimey, it was only 15p last week. This inflation's killing me. <coughs> now, I happened to arrive in the Treasury in 1970. When I got there, people really felt that they didn't quite understand. <laughs> yeah, credit. <laughs> credit expansion led to inflation. <laughs> oh, no fucking shit. <laughs> Oh, I, d I just don't understand why these extremely obvious uh, facts continue to elude all of these people. Um, and it's the same thing today. You could, you could literally, that little scene with the woman in the deck chair, you could have played that last year, where we, where we got ridiculous inflation in the past couple of years. I don't understand how the economy worked anymore. And one particular example of this was that we saw unemployment and inflation rising at the same time. And that was something that should have been quite impossible. And while this was going on, they're sitting in Chicago in, in the States with the monetarists who said, no, we know perfectly well what's going on. We can explain it. You've been led astray by your Keynesian beliefs. And we can explain precisely what's going on. And it's all to do with the growth of the money supply. I and people who believe the way that we did were saying that a continuation of the policies was going to lead to higher inflation and more unemployment. It represented a recognition that fine efforts to produce paradise on earth were producing something very different than what was intended. Friedman argued that any attempt to put money into the economy to make it grow was doomed to failure. 
But he was not challenging the idea of the economy as a predictable system, only how it worked. He considered his laws were as powerful and objective as those of the physical sciences. It was scientific. Inflation is not a communist phenomenon. It's not a capitalist phenomenon. It's a printing press phenomenon. That's a scientific statement. And you will only have inflation if the quantity of money increases more rapidly than output. You can only stop inflation by slowing down the rate of monetary growth. Monetarism often... Now, now, now I have to admit that uh, despite what is said later on in this, uh, despite what happens, I don't really understand the logic of people who say that the, what Friedman said isn't true. Because to me, it's just a basic um, exchange ratio proposition, right? You have a total amount of money in the economy. If you keep on pouring more in, the prices are going to go up because there's the exchange ratio of money to all other goods has changed and it will adjust to reflect that. So, I mean, I, I don't really understand the logic of people who deny what Friedman said there, but... Uh, well, we'll see what happens. An attractive technical explanation for the problem of inflation. But from it would come in less than 10 years another scheme for Britain's salvation. A set of scientific rules which, if the politicians followed them correctly, would create the right conditions for economic growth. It began with a disillusioned group of economists. They included two influential journalists, Peter Jay of the Times and Sam Britton of the Financial Times. We were found to be stimulating and interesting, which are the English words for damning people. And we were always regarded as good for a puzzling interlude in a programme such as this. Of a complete runaway inflation and an internal collapse of confidence in the I currency. Think, I'm sorry, I think, Mr. Britton, that that's an exaggeration when you start talking about runaway inflation in Germany after the First World War. I think, quite frankly, that that's an exaggeration that can't be sustained by anyone. But I think Can we stay on our home ground for the moment? Yes. <laughs> if there was one place where we tended to bump into each other, it was the Institute of Economic Affairs. Good God Almighty. This is the right place, the cooperative whatnot thing? Yes, do come in. We were just about to begin without you. Oh, I took the wrong turning, and not for the first time. Found myself in a room full of trade unionists cooking up the next wage claim. All Tories, of course. Didn't take to me at all. Milton Friedman would, would set up, a, we'd set up a table here to maximise the array of people that we could fit in. We could probably fit in 20 or 25 people in this small room. And uh, he would uh, develop his argument briefly, very emphatically, in strong... No, no I, I, I think I've been there, ladies and gentlemen, if it's the same office, but uh, I recognise these pictures on the wall. But, uh, anyway. ...strong form. And uh, he would say, if you want uh, details of this and particular episodes in American history, I can go back to that. And then the discussion would take place. To start with, I must admit, I, I didn't believe the monetarists for a moment. It, this seemed totally implausible. This was the sort of economics that i have been told to discard for all the time I'd been learning economics. It was. A I mean, how is, it how is it implausible that increasing the money supply would lead to inflation? I just don't understand it. You can see it with, um, histor like, the historical situation I would look at is the gold rush of the 19th century. They experienced inflation in the mid-19th century when they, when they struck gold in, uh, in the, on the West Coast, uh, California and all, all of that. And the gold flooded into the money supply and it cr created inflation in the mid-19th century. How is that not just completely you know, non-refutable? I don't understand how this dude or current economists uh, dispute the claim why is it implausible surely it is it should be like the null hypothesis and then you have to prove why anyway let's carry on a joke really it wasn't to be taken seriously whatever else one used to explain inflation it wasn't the money supply a bit far-fetched perhaps you couldn't see it happening in real life oh i i wouldn't go as far as that life's always surprising me
In February of 1974, Edward Heath's government fell, amid power cuts, a three-day week, and never-ending inflation. They were direct consequences of his crude dash for growth. The time was ripe for the monetarists, in particular Alan Walters, a professor from the London School of Economics. He began to attract both press and politicians with apocalyptic warnings of what was to come. A reduction in output, an increase in unemployment, and at the same time, rampant inflation. Inflation of the order of perhaps 30%, perhaps even increasing as we go on. Uh, there is a real danger of hyperinflation. Alan Walters had snubbed me when I went back to meet old friends. Once I was, once the government fell and I was back in, I was back as, as a member of parliament without a government post. And Alan Walters refused to shake my hand. He said, you've been debauching the currency. Why should I welcome you back? <laughs> and I started to rethink what we'd been up to. And a fellow called Alfred Sherman was very influential in convincing me. He used to say, don't you know, Keynes is dead. Keynes is dead. I didn't understand what he meant. He turned to me for help. And I managed to persuade him to go further and look at the whole Keynesian mumbo-jumbo, the panacea. Keith Joseph toured the country, translating monetarism into a political programme. The primary job of economics was no longer to create employment, he said. It was to reduce inflation. After having failed to persuade the shadow cabinet to reconsider our economic policies, I warned them that I'd have to make a speech. <laughs> Well, the speech was made. I remember, I, I remember that I said to Sam Britton, who looked at one of the drafts, this speech has been through nine drafts. We're trying to get it right. And Alfred Sherman from the background said, yes, and I wrote 13 of them. <laughs> well, we slogged at that speech. It's threatening to destroy our society. The distress and unemployment that will follow unless the trend is stopped will be catastrophic. Inflation is caused by spending more than we produce, too much money chasing too few goods, deficit financing, printing money. Mild inflation seemed a painless way of maintaining full employment, encouraging growth and expanding the social services. We now see that inflation has turned out to be a mortal threat to all three. But Labour was in power. As before, they had inherited the chaos of a conservative boom. Yet this time, none of the traditional Keynesian methods offered them any help, because inflation and unemployment were rising together. It was something the Keynesians believed impossible. By the end of 1975, the economists advising the government were lost. I mean, when I was watching this earlier on, <clears throat> I couldn't help but think, this country has been a total and utter shit show since 1945 like literally it has been a shit show how does anything work here it's it's, it's remarkable i just don't know how anything works at all uh given given the total mess of the past 80 years but there we are my memory is i think it was a dinner party i deliberately organized where the main economic models were there. The Treasury was represented, the Bank was represented, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, London Business School. I was a fly on the wall, and they were talking about the median term projections and their models. And they were unanimous. that They could not project what was going to happen to inflation or to unemployment or the balance of payments. There was almost total agreement around the room that the UK was in serious danger of going to absolute decline, that was negative growth, not just growing at a slower rate than other industrialised countries. That is when the civil servants in the Treasury and the Bank of England realised that the UK economy had arrived at the brink of the abyss. They had sight of the awfulness of what that abyss might look like, and they were shell-shocked as a result of it. Everything. 
Then, in March 1976, Britain fell into the abyss. 2030, 2030. Change, change. 2025. Foreign investors, led by American bankers, panicked. The pound began to slide against the dollar, and nothing would stop it. Sorry? It's lost 20, 25 in a stock. 10, 25, stock it. It dropped 100 points. We don't know why. It just dropped 100 points when everything else was staying sturdy. Britain faced bankruptcy. In desperation, Labour turned to the International Monetary Fund for a loan. Oh, fuck it. Talk about it from the fire, from the frying pan into the fire. The IMF gets involved now. Oh, brilliant. An IMF team came to London. They were determined that the only way to restore confidence was for the British government to adopt monetarist policies. In a speech that could have been written by Keith Joseph, Prime Minister James Callaghan told the Labour Party why it had to do what the financial markets wanted. We used to think that you could use, spend your way out of a recession and increase employment by cutting taxes and boosting government spending. I tell you in all candour that that option no longer exists and that in so far as it ever did exist, it only worked on each occasion since the war by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy on every occasion followed by a higher level of unemployment as the next step. It was presented scientifically, but then they always presented scientifically as being the only way of doing it. There is no alternative. And this gripped people, uh, but at the same time you must never forget that politics is in the pursuit of an interest and an ideology, and if the scientist helps you with the ideology, you use him. If he doesn't, you disregard him. So the... Look at that. Tony Bell, uh, Tony Ben, based and BSBS, therefore I rule, anti-ideology build. <laughs> conflict between, as it were, Milton Friedman and Keynes was a political conflict. It wasn't uh, really that it was people solemnly assessing the different values of two sets of ideas. One benefited one group, another benefited another. Honestly, I, I feel like the details of this one are so important. I'm just I'm probably just going to watch the whole thing, and I'll I'll skip through the final episode of uh, Oceans Apart uh, in, in part two. In December 1976, the IMF granted a loan to Britain. That same month, Milton Friedman was awarded the Nobel Prize. In just five years, his economic theory had moved from the margins to centre stage. It was seen by many politicians as the only solution to Britain's disastrous economic position. And waiting in the wings was Friedman's most devoted follower, a politician who believed it was possible to use monetarism as the basis of a plan to regenerate the country. Keith Joseph was now the closest advisor to the new leader of the Tory party, Margaret Thatcher. He and the economists around him had drawn up what was called the medium-term financial strategy. The boss. The boss. Uh, and then with their want us all out. Angus, hello, in you go. And in particular, I'll bring you all out in a moment. The plan was to combine monetarism with another theory from economics called rational expectations. It said that whenever a government changes policy, it will only work if the politicians can persuade people they are going to stick with it whatever happens we believe now, now i was interested by this because it strikes me that whatever our elites do now it's not on the on the rational expectations model because our leaders chop and change and chop and change and chop and change their plans so regularly and so frantically now that we have the opposite of the rational expectations model i would call what they do now something like um perpetual bewilderment and if uh, this series ever gets to hyper normalization adam curtis himself will talk about exactly that kind of perpetual bewilderment that we're all in all the time now um he does it looking at putin's russia but really that's what they're doing to us that in in announcing and publishing a mid-term financial strategy of what we were going to do 
with the crucial element of the money supply, <clears throat> we would persuade the negotiators, the managements and the trade unions, <clears throat> and the opinion formers uh, that uh, there must be some limit to pay claims if jobs were not to be priced out of the market. A rational expectation. It was to get away from short-termism. And in that respect, it had something in common with the national plan, a comparison of which I am not ashamed. And as with the national plan, it was all very simple. The supply of money was to be reduced by raising interest rates and cutting public spending. Inflation would fall and enterprise flourish. Instead of putting money in, as Labour had done 15 years before, this time the theory said it should be tightly controlled. We are gathered here to discuss phase one of the operation. Now, I don't have to tell you that as a general rule, banks take very good care of people's money. They are not going to give it to us, um, so we shall have to take it. Monetarism worked throughout the 19th century, when we were the envy of the world. Now, now, can I just say something a second? That, that statement by him just now was absolutely bollocks, by the way. They did not exercise monetarism in the 19th century. It's just not true that they exercise, that the policy of the British Empire was monetarism. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. They, they didn't have somebody um, on the levers of the government trying to control the money supply in, in, the, in the way that Milton Friedman and friends wanted to do. Um, in, in fact, as I've shown on this channel many times, they had uh, they had uh, deflationary economies for much of the uh, much of the nineteenth century in England. Um, so I, I, I reject the claim uh, that they had uh, that they used monetarism in the nineteenth century. With our people growing in numbers and generally prospering generally, despite all the horrors of the time, generally prospering, with the world looking to us for how to do it. It could work again. There arose a slightly messianic sense of mission. Haven't you heard of inflation? I'll tell you what I don't want to see. What's that? Labour in power again. Labour in power? Was that the Marx Brothers? No. <laughs> Another bunch of comedians. <laughs> Coming shortly. The Conservatives. <laughs> I can't bear Britain in decline. I just can't. We who either defeated or rescued half Europe, who kept half Europe free, when otherwise it would be in chains. Look at this boomer truth crap from Thatcher here. Because of course, of course, Thatcher was a Churchill fangirl. So that's why she's coming out with all of this. And look at us now. The Thatcher government is a kind of an experiment in whether it will be possible in a democratic society that has gone as far as Britain has gone to change course in an orderly, effective way to set Britain on a new road. If, if the Thatcher government succeeds, it will be an example that will not be lost on the United States or the rest of the world. An, an experiment, eh, Milton? An experiment for who? Okay, let's, let's see what happens. The latest unemployed from the Royal Stafford helped form an unwelcoming committee for Mrs. Thatcher as she arrived at the But Royal the economy Board. did not behave in the way the monetarists predicted. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all these plans fail too. <laughs> The squeeze on money led to a wave of factory closures, while inflation continued to rise. Which factory is closed? A small one, which has suffered from lack of investment, among other things. I've been in insolvency for all my professional life, and I think up until 1980, I used to go in with a great deal of confidence that with new management and um, perhaps some sort of reorganisation, something could be done. It was very sad to have to go onto the shop floor in the early 80s into a company knowing, in fact, that there wasn't much chance of, of selling that business and that, in fact, the, the business would come to an end. This is what would normally be a working day. It's the middle of the week. And we're now down in this plant, which produces well over half the cast iron baths of the United Kingdom. 
on to uh, one week on, one week off. And that's an immediate and practical effect of the strict monetarism policy that the government is carrying out. The managing director said, uh, I'm very sorry to tell you, but as from this minute, the firm has gone into voluntary liquidisation. That was it. And somebody shouted, will we get any wages? And he said, you'll get nothing. There now follows a government statement on the current employment figures. <laughs> seems to have totally lost its way in terms of the interaction of four economic indicators on British industry. Oh, God. <laughs> as every member of any firm knows, once with high interest rates as a weapon for controlling money supply, what is the first thing that has to be cut? Investment. Because you still have to pay wages and you still have to pay your current costs. One day, we may be able to afford it. <laughs> I get the economic policy right. <laughs> yeah. The government would say, just hang on and stop making such a fuss now. Yeah, all I can say is that the government isn't standing where I'm bloody well standing. Even more mystifying was the behaviour of the money supply. See, the thing is, is that when all that industry went, it didn't come back again. Right? It's not like there was new investment or new... new it, basically, all those just went. All of that industry, gone. All the infrastructure gone. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what the answer. Is. I don't know what the answer is because clearly what was happening before wasn't working, but this fucking didn't work either. Let's carry on. Despite the squeeze, it was still growing. Something the monetarists thought impossible. Well, it was all a bit embarrassing. People like me who were at the Bank of England, because uh, we'd been forced. You know, the government had signed up. Uh, for this path of gently declining monetary aggregates. And instead of the monetary aggregates gently declining, some five or six months after this new policy was put into operation, they took an enormous jump. And it was very difficult to know why, or to know what ought to be done about it. So the money supply was going up rather than down, and they didn't know why. <laughs> By the end of 1980, unemployment had nearly doubled. Manufacturing output had fallen by a sixth. Britain was declining faster than even in the darkest days of the 1930s. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Despite this, the politicians were convinced they were right. The laws of their science told them so. Let me just have a word about monetarism and monetary control first. I mean, you all know full well that if you produce too much of something, its value will fall. That's elementary. It isn't a newfangled theory. It is as essential as the law of gravity, and you can't avoid it. People used to say, you're destroying my job, and I was absolutely secure in my conscience that their negotiators and their employers were destroying their jobs by not following rational expectations and seeing that if they didn't accommodate units Labour costs by a combination of pay, increases allowed, and rising productivity to what would keep their prices internationally competitive, jobs would go. So there was I absolutely clear in my conscience, uh, and there were they convinced in their, what I would call, invincible ignorance that I was an enemy. Yes, it was awkward time. There's no question that what was happening did, in my view, a great deal of damage to the economy. The politicians of the day will never admit to that. They never admit to making mistakes at all. But it's quite clear that's what was happening. They were trying to do it right, but they got it wrong. In January 1981, Alan Walters became Mrs Thatcher's economic advisor. Although a convinced monetarist, he agreed with Sir John Hoskins that interest rates would have to come down. This, in turn, would reduce the exchange rate and make exports more competitive. But the problem was how to do it without admitting that all the destruction of the past two years had been for nothing. The only solution, they said, was to cut even more from public spending. That way the government would be seen to be keeping up its squeeze on the money supply. What we said was, we will take a deep breath and take an enormous amount of money out of the economy 
but at, a, at, the, at the nadir of a major recession. I mean, it's against every textbook that's ever been written or all the Keynesian conventional wisdom which prevailed at the time. Uh, and uh, thus, hopefully, by that insurance, uh, make it very unlikely that we would have to put interest rates back up again just at the wrong moment. At a meeting with Mrs. Thatcher and uh, Geoffrey Howe, they were both absolutely taken aback. I think they could hardly believe their ears. Uh, and then Mrs. Thatcher was saying very indignantly, you know, it's, it's all very well for you, but uh, you don't have to stand up and defend it in the house. <laughs> In the budget of 1981, public borrowing was cut by a fifth. 364 leading economists wrote to the Times and the Prime Minister, accusing her of virtually destroying the economy. Just to impress upon you the need for portion. That summer, there were riots in English cities that even some cabinet members blamed on the economic policy. Unemployment headed towards two and a half million. Inflation did begin to fall, but the money supply continued its mysterious rise. <laughs> still going. <laughs> money supply is still going. <laughs> oh, oh, man. It became clear that the fundamental law of monetarism, the relationship between the money supply and inflation, didn't work. Ever so quietly, this solution to Britain's problems was discarded. Now, this was one of the most interesting parts of this documentary for me, right? Because in shorthand, people say, well, Thatcher comes in, she's all about Milton Friedman and Hayek and all of that. Um, these were her policies. This little detail here, which is that they basically drop monetarism right at this point, I think is really interesting. Let's have a little watch. Finally, the man who had first brought the monetarist message to Britain was publicly told it was over. Monetarist economists believe in something called the natural rate of unemployment, which is supposed to be the rate at which uh, inflation stops or ceases to accelerate. Now, do you think that we, Prime Minister, with all-time record unemployment figures this week, have yet reached that natural rate, even though inflation is still proceeding sufficiently to halve the value of money every 15 years? It's not a doctrine to which I've ever subscribed. It's one which I think actually came in with Milton Friedman. I used to read about it, I used to look about it. It's not a doctrine. It's a theory to which I've never subscribed. <laughs> Oh, you've got to love politicians, eh? <laughs> she never subscribed to it. No, never, never bloody heard of him. <laughs> Some of those who had lived through the experiment now became deeply pessimistic. One economist saw it as proof that it was fundamentally impossible to change, in a predictable way, how an economy behaved. As in other sciences, his observation had a formal name, Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law said that if ever the government decides to rely on any particular statistical relationship as a basis for policy, as soon as it did that, that relationship would fall apart. And that's just what happened. Now, I, I thought this was fascinating. I spent a good deal of time earlier on reading about Goodhart's law. Um, basically, as, as I understand it in, in, in a kind of shorthand way, what he's saying is, is that if you take a particular metric and you make that the focus of whatever your policy is, the focus of your plans, the incentives around whatever that thing is will change sufficiently that that will become a new, like the original thing you were trying to solve will fall apart. That's how I understand what he's saying, but uh, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong. I thought this was very, very interesting, this segment, which is why I've basically watched the whole documentary, because I think this is just, as an economics fan, I thought this was a very, very uh, interesting bit of history to look over. <clears throat> the implication is that what you should try and do is not to disturb things too much and let individual agents go on and try and make the best of the situation as each of them sees it individually. I beg your pardon. Whatever promise you wrote, God. It 
was a conclusion that fitted well with conservative philosophy. If there was nothing that governments could do, then the economic agents in a newly liberated city of London should be left alone. Unlike the economists, they seemed to know how money worked. The city's growing confidence and drive owes a good deal to young people. Its vast new dealing rooms are run by the young. People who made it not because of who they know or what school tie they wear, but on sheer merit. And that is... Merit! ...is the kind of society I want to see. Uh, capital was available, ideas were available, and there was a, a, um, a keenness to do things. And I think that uh, probably the government felt that our merchant bankers and the city of London, which after all had put us on the map, there they were again, they were to go out and they were going to uh, make us great again, if you like. Money now became a commodity traded for itself. It was managed by young technicians in the dealing rooms. Economists who once thought they could control money became its servants. They were now employed in their hundreds by the banks to predict on television what might or might not happen as a result of the colossal flows of capital. What do you see? It is, of course, extremely uncertain, but my view is that... But I guess there's still a lot more to come. We're currently saying people fear that there will be a rerun of what happened a fortnight ago. I suspect it'll certainly not stop. There is, however, a risk that interest rates will have to go higher. It may even get worse. When you get a loss of faith, say, if bishops cease to believe in God, they're going for socialism or sodomy. But an <laughs> economist who's, who's agnostic about economics is unemployable. And therefore, they said, we know if you do this and if you do that. And the economists will argue with each other, but none of them will ever question whether economics is as scientific as it claims. Great, great Britain, the finest country in the world, right? And let us not forget who made it Great Britain this last eight years. When I go to the Western Summit in Venice on Monday, I will go with my head held high as leader of a strong country. There were people earning a lot of money without doing anything at all in this world of money. Then it suddenly came to a dramatic halt in the 80s. Uh, the reasons I can't give you, you'll need to talk to a qualified economist and no doubt they'll have differing views on why it happened. But the system overnight became much more cutthroat. We had examples of firms right out of the blue calling fire drills, locking their employees out and throwing their belongings from the window to them and saying, sorry chaps, you're fired. That's how bad things became. The bubble burst again. But that's what happens in history. You'll have these, uh, these slumps and these booms and, and you won't change it because that's what capitalism is really, isn't it? I don't think we can change the world. It's not something we can do. Certainly we insolvency specialists can't. Our job is sweeping up or trying to prevent. Now, as far as I can see, the best way is to try and see whether we can do something about stopping people being greedy and stopping people being overambitious. And I don't think you ever will do that. I mean, the economists seem to think that... Just, just give up. <laughs> just give up. Let the merchants just slowly take over all aspects of society. Just give up. Uh, basically, what's happened, really, isn't it? <laughs> so the whole of the problems can be solved by, by money, uh, by the use of money rather than the creation of wealth. But they've never really got anywhere near it. Uh, so I would ask the question, whose money? What money? Where is it coming from? Ten years ago, Britain was a loser. Today, Britain is a winner. Is the party over? Yes, Bunny, the party's over. The drink and the luck ran out. Economics has really obscured uh, the fundamental problems of the British economy by seeming to be able to give a particular solution by pulling a particular lever or pulling a set of levers. It's obscured the longer term decline in our industries, the longer term decline in the quality of our labour force, 
which politicians should really have been addressing 30 or 40 years ago, and which some of our European competitors, who've turned out far fewer economists in Britain, by the way, uh, have succeeded in doing uh, much better than we have in the UK. For some economists who were involved in the, the Germans, for example, whatever they did, they did pretty well after the war, I would say. I mean, some would say before the war too, but, uh, you know, the Germans in general have done better at managing their economy than Britain has, certainly at managing their manufacturing industries. Um, I mean, now they're being absolutely uh, screwed uh, right now, like in the past few years. Uh, the, the Germans are currently getting their, you know, the whirlwind's coming to reap for them now. But, you know, they did well for a while. <clears throat> this story, there is a further question. Were their theories used to disguise political policies that would otherwise have been very difficult to implement in Britain? The nightmare I sometimes have about this whole experience runs as follows. Uh, I was involved in making a number of proposals which were partly at least adopted by the government and put in play by the government. Now, my worry is as follows, that there may have been people making the actual policy decisions or people behind them or people behind them who never believed for a moment that this was the correct way to bring down inflation. They did, however, see that it would be a very, very good way to raise unemployment. And raising unemployment was an extremely desirable way of, of reducing the strength of the working classes, if you like, that what was engineered there. Now, this is an interesting bit of left-wing conspiracy here. Uh, here. But this was basically a form of class warfare to crush the working class, to crush the power that had been vested in the working class. Um, now, I have a book by uh, a little pamphlet by F.A. Hayek here talking about unemployment in the 1980s in Britain. Um, so it, it cost me a pretty penny back in the day, I can tell you, kind of, kind of rare. It's called, um, let me just pull it out here. <clears throat> It's called 1980s Unemployment and the Unions, the Distortion of Relative Prices by Monopoly in the Labour Markets. Um, it was published in 1984 by the Institute of Economic Affairs. And um, uh, if you read that book carefully, there may well be something to what... Uh, this chap is saying, uh, although Hayek would not have explained it in those terms, um, he does basically say that shitload of people are going to have to lose their jobs, though, <laughs> um, in this book. Uh, he says, no salvation for Britain until union privileges are revoked. Um, and if you remember when I did the stream on John Gray a few weeks back, um, it was a special one-off stream about how the Thatcher government destroyed what he called intermediary institutions, centralized power in the government, and took them away from the intermediary institutions that stood between um, uh, capital and labor, if you want to put it that way, not just unions, but other institutions too. Um, basically, you could say in shorthand, that is what they did. They did break the working class. Yeah, in Marxist terms, was a crisis of capitalism which recreated the reserve army of labour and has allowed the capitalists to make high profits ever since. Now, again, I don't say I believe that story, but when I really worry about all this, I worry whether indeed that was really what was going on. What we now doubt, which we used to think, was that our models will enable us to look into the future and indeed to change the future uh, to the benefit of mankind. Um, we, the experience of recent years has been such that as soon as we develop a model that seems to be reasonably good at explaining the present, and there are few enough of those, God knows now, um, the future changes. We live in an imperfect world, and if that's true, how are you ever going to make it a better world? We can perhaps hope that we can prevent it becoming a worse world. 
I don't think that we can easily make it a better world. Now, now, now this Goodhart chap, I don't know much about him, but he's of interest to me because he's starting to sound quite a lot like an Austrian economist in some of these, uh, you know, uh, the uncertainty of the future, the impossibility of models working, um, the futility of trying to model these things. I mean, he's he's coming to a lot of uh, Austrian positions here, kind of around the back door. Kind of interesting. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. No Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was fantastic. Really interesting. Um, and as ever with Curtis, he, you know, it's the little bits that are forgotten. You know, the fact that Thatcher dropped monetarism mid, you know, after the early cup disastrous first couple of years, she actually dropped the policy. Very interesting indeed to me. Um, so anyway, uh, let us um, now get on to the Reagan and Falklands War. Um, and uh, I'll just say, I mean, we're going to be finishing off with Oceans Apart. And I'll just say going into this uh, final part of Oceans Apart, that uh, as a whole, I loved Oceans Apart. I thought it was a really, I thought it was a lot better than I was expecting it to be. And um, I'm going to miss David Dimbleby going forward in this Adam Curtis. I mean, as much I do love Adam Curtis as a as a narrator, and uh, but I I think Dimbleby's been a you know a welcome presence in Oceans Apart. So I'm going to be sad when he when when he's gone after this week. So uh, let's uh, start this one. An ocean apart is made possible in part by British Airways, serving North... Well, people want a break. Why are people... Okay, what I'll do is I'll read Super Chats so that you ne'er do well and have a break. Well, you know, you know. Um, speaking of breaks, by the way, I hope you've all subscribed to AA Mellow, 9 a.m. every morning, every single day, AA Mellow. And I'm going to keep try to keep on that, that going. Get a cup of mellow birds. Now, unfortunately, I've discovered that mellow birds has calories in it and may be breaking my fast. Now, I can't get stable numbers on the calories, but essentially, if it's not a zero calorie drink, it has been unwittingly breaking my 16 hour fasts, which is not good. That means that my uh, rate of weight loss over the past couple of weeks since I've been drinking Mellow Birds, ironically, given how much I've loved it, um, is going to be... So that means that I can only drink Mellow Birds in my eight-hour window of eating now, and I'm going to have to stick with uh, zero-calorie drinks. Coffee's meant to be zero-calorie, zero but apparently there are hidden calories in Mellow Birds, which has made me very sad. Um... um so, I mean, I would love to, if somebody knows about Mellow Birds, um, look into, yeah, somebody's saying it's 200 plus calories a cup. I mean, that's no good for me. Um, I, I mean, I have not been drinking that. I had a lot of it yesterday because I recorded that show. But um, I've definitely had one or two cups outside of my eight-hour window. So that's that's no good at all. Um uh, I'll just uh, read a couple of super chats that have come in while people are having their break, because uh, you know it's 2024 and everybody's a spiritual woman who can't last. Uh... <laughs> um, Mighty Sebastian says, "Hello, AA. I made the mistake of saying something to you on your timeline Twitter, and will refrain from it in the future." Oh well, well, thank thanks for that, Mighty Sebastian. You have to understand that I don't understand any jokes. I mean, I understand jokes when I'm on a stream with somebody, um, but not in written form. Uh, Adam e says, is this period where the growth failed the time? Uh, is this period where growth failed the time when Soros made his billion shorting the pound? That sounds right. That sounds right. And um, we're going to be looking at corporate raiders when we get onto the Mayfair set. 
Um, I mean, Adam Curtis really had documents this period of history, which is of intense interest to me, um, and looks at Britain and looks at America in in real detail. In these, it was one of the reasons why I thought this would be something worth doing, right? Um, and I have confirmed a guest for the Mayfair set, very knowledgeable guest, Horus. He's a kind of, a, he, you know, he does history shows and he's kind of a dissident historian, Horus is. And um, so I'm looking forward to getting to the Mayfair set. I don't know if he talks about George Soros in particular, but there's a lot of dodgy activity that goes on during during this time. Um, okay, so uh, I think that's enough of a break, is it not? That's enough of a break. Let us now get on to the final part of an Oceans Apart. And uh, um, i kind of grown really fond of this series, Oceans Apart. I thought it was, uh, you know, going to be sad that this is the last part. So enjoy David Dimbleby while he's still with us. America to London and beyond. Hanson, a company which has provided basic goods and services since 1964 and attained increased profits, dividends, and earnings per share every year. Hanson, here today, here tomorrow. And by this and other public television stations. We may not have our own kings and queens, but today New Yorkers got their own taste of a royal wedding. The bride's from Chicago, Keith's from New York, but they look like they come from a fairy tale palace in England. It's America's way of saluting the marriage of Charles and Diana. The real thing happens tomorrow in London St. Paul's Cathedral. By the late 1970s and early 80s, there wasn't much left of a special relationship between Britain and America. There was, of course, America's love of British traditions and, in particular, of the British monarchy. But otherwise, for America, Britain was just another friendly ally, a country whose people happened to watch Dallas on television and eat hamburgers. <laughs> Brilliant. Um... And uh, I did a bit of a search, and I found. Uh, let's see if I've still got it on my computer here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this, but um, I found uh, a thing from 1981 of a guy. Uh, and welcome to that. This I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this, but it's um, basically the introduction of fast food uh, in 1981. Um, you can find this on YouTube yourself, or I put it on Twitter a couple of days back, where they uh, they basically go to a McDonald's in 1981, and they talk about how the government basically was encouraging people to go and eat fast food for the good of the economy. Really quite fascinating watch. So uh, I won't play it because I'm not, it's BBC, and then BBC are funny about copyright. But um, yeah, definitely worth a watch that. Um, I put it on Twitter, just type in like 1981 BBC fast food and it'll come up um, on the BBC archives there. Anyway, let's continue. Within months of the royal wedding here in St. Paul's Cathedral, the old relationship was to be revived. It happened because Britain found herself in a military crisis and, as on other occasions, turned to the United States for help, hoping that the old ties would still hold good. Now, I have to say, going into this, that America has not come off particularly well. Uh, I mean, Britain hasn't either, especially not Churchill, um, in this documentary so far. But in this final episode, I have to say that I thought the Americans during the Thatcher years came off better than the British and Thatcher. Um, I honestly thought that uh, the Americans actually were pretty honourable during Falk Falklands, and uh, as we'll see, and um, I think they were pretty like. Honestly, I feel like the Thatcher government was pretty scummy, uh, as we'll see. <laughs> uh, 
no, 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 knockers saying yank f fence sitters. You're not going to be saying that in 20 minutes, I'm telling you. British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising... Uh, by the way, if you're wondering how Margaret Thatcher won that election after all that economic damage, she won it on this. She didn't win it because of, because of the economic policies uh, in 83. She won it because of this. Uh, anyway, let's carry on. ...tension in our relations with Argentina. That country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. The government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are... If the Argentinian invasion came as a shock to Britain, Britain's dispatch of a task force to the South Atlantic came as an equal shock to America. Washington was not consulted. President Reagan faced a dilemma. The prospect of war between Britain, America's closest partner in NATO, and Argentina, whose support he planned to use in the battle against communism in Central America. It's a very difficult situation for the United States because we're friends with both of the countries engaged in this dispute. And we stand ready to do anything we can to help them. And what we hope for and would like to help in doing is have a peaceful resolution of this uh, with uh, no forceful action or no bloodshed. The president publicly stated that America was neutral and instructed his secretary of state, Alexander Haig, to seek a peaceful settlement. Haig's team came first to London. They were told firmly by Mrs. Thatcher that no diplomatic compromise was possible unless Argentina complied with a United Nations resolution and withdrew all its forces from the Falklands. Her mood was, uh, I would say, uh, combative. I believe she just removed two paintings in one room and replaced them with, uh, as I remembered, Wellington and Nelson. Uh, other people had been on that particular wall before. And they had been replaced by Wellington and Nelson. And uh, she said uh, something like, and I'm not sure, she said, in this room is where Neville Chamberlain said, why should we go to war for a far distant nation about which we know so little and with which we have so little in common? I do not intend to repeat that mistake. And since I remembered hearing Neville Chamberlain being quoted as saying that, a slight shiver ran down my spine. Thank you very much. Are you having a nice day? Yes, yes, yes Lord, Lord, have a the, the, the Churchill worship of uh, Thatcher is just unreal, by the way, unreal. Um, although I do think putting the Wellington and the Nelson paintings up was uh, low-key based by Thatcher, but still. what chances are of peace? In spite of the Prime Minister's air of calm determination, the British government was worried by America's neutrality. Memories went back 30 years to Suez. On that occasion, the United States had undermined Britain's attempt to recapture the canal because it conflicted with her own interests in the Middle East. Britain was determined that this time things would be different and set about winning American public opinion to her side. You were very concerned when you had 52 hostages. We have 2,000 hostages down there. Large principles are at stake of whether on the American continent you allow aggression to pay and the principle of self-determination which you, the Americans, established to be overthrown. Were you fearful that Suez might be repeated over the Falklands? Very, very frightened, because it uh, had the colonial overtones that you might say had promoted American suspicion over Suez. I suppose instinctively I made a lot of what I thought were aspects of Britain, British life, that um, had a strong appeal in America, particularly the Navy. The chiefs of staff had told the government that it was one thing to send the task force as a threat to make the Argentinians negotiate, quite another to have to use it in an assault on the Falklands. British troops would be fighting 8,000 miles from home with no radar protection against enemy aircraft, no guaranteed fuel supplies and no information about the enemy's movements. But it seemed impossible to turn to America for support. The administration had proclaimed its neutrality and was itself divided 
on what to do. I argue that we should maintain neutrality in that conflict. And uh, I, what, uh, the reason I argue that we should maintain neutrality was, first of all, that the United States had uh, a very significant stake in good relations with Latin America generally, all of Latin America. I had also learned by then in the United Nations that Britain frequently maintains a position of neutrality with regard to American conflicts with other nations. That, um, so it wouldn't have been introducing any new factor into our relationship for us. As in, as in Vietnam, as we saw last, last week. To maintain neutrality in case of a British conflict with another nation where we had a stick. Britain knew she needed America's help, but she also knew the difficulty that the Americans were in. If they were seen to side with Britain, they risked losing the new friends that they'd been courting so carefully in South America. If they didn't, they risked seeing an important NATO ally go down to defeat. As long as America was officially neutral and seeking a diplomatic settlement, there was no possibility of asking her openly for support. And so the British government decided to act in extreme secrecy. They turned to the people at the top of the American Department of Defense who they thought they could rely on, not to let an old friend down. What did you decide America should do? Well, I think it was very clear that we, uh, we had our ally uh, in, the, in England and uh, that we should help in every way that we could. That wasn't a unanimous opinion, I suppose, in the United States government, but it was the reaction I had and um, the reaction the president had. How soon did help start? Very soon. It uh, were the first requests. Caspar Weinberger decided that Britain should be provided with everything she wanted and as fast as possible. Without seeking the support of the American cabinet, he instructed his deputies to make use of the private channels which had been maintained between the two countries' navies ever since World War II. I mean, this is a fascinating little, uh, little bit of history here. The underhand and clandestine close level of cooperation between Washington and uh, London here, despite the official stance of neutrality. Very interesting. Most of the American administration was kept in the dark, though the president himself knew what was being done. Well, it really began when the force uh, was ordered to start down well before it ever arrived. While uh, there was certainly no attempt to try to hide anything from anyone else in the administration, Neither did we. We just didn't tell them. <laughs> we, did, we didn't hide it exactly. We just didn't tell them what we were doing. <laughs> Go out of our way because we were busy to try to educate people on what was really going on. And it really wasn't an attempt to uh, hide things. But most people in the American government simply don't know how close the relationship is between the two navies. And they didn't know then how much was passing through the channels with direct support to the Falklands. There was no need to establish a new relationship because... Uh, forget about the actual government. We'll just, um, we'll just do it anyway. We'll just tell, we'll tell them later. Act first. Tell them later. Blair's motto, eh? Because it, it flows all the time. And it was really just turning up the volume. I think almost on day one, I telephoned or signaled uh, my opposite number and asked for an assessment of the Argentinian forces operational effectiveness knowing no, 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 all of this by the way is really quite surprising to me because it's the only time in this entire seven part documentary where it just seems like Thatcher said fuck it I'm gonna I'm going to do the Fal Falklands are you with me and they were like yeah okay yeah we'll just do it I, I don't I don't really understand like this is the only time really where the Americans have almost kind of tripped over themselves to help Britain not vice versa and as far as I can tell there wasn't really that much kind of fuckery involved with this particular bit so I don't really, like, there's something odd about this, because this is, like, when I was watching it earlier and when I'm watching it back now, I'm thinking, like, the Americans just did a solid. No strings, like, they just did a solid for once in their lives. Kind of amazing.
that they exercise with them regularly. The United States Navy does a, a cruise around South America every year exercising with the navies in turn. And they would have more recent knowledge of the operational effectiveness and tactics. Um, and he sent me almost a book, uh, which was extremely useful, particularly about their submarine uh, tactics. Did, did you hear that then? <laughs> the Americans were doing joint military exercises or joint naval exercises with the Argentinians. And then, so they had basically, you know, intimate knowledge of the capacities of the Argentinian Navy. And they just gave that dude a book basically detailing all of their strategies, all of their capacities. I mean, I mean it's just kind of incredible. The greatest part of their assistance was logistic. Uh, particularly the use of the airfield at Ascension, which was vital, absolutely vital. Ascension Island was the key to the secret help given to Britain. The US airbase there was sealed off to the outside world. Transport planes flew in round the clock, carrying supplies from American stocks to be ferried out to the ships of the task force as they paused on their way south. Those in the Pentagon organizing this operation knew that if the full scale of it was revealed, it would seriously damage America. We were not naive, we were not children. We knew what the effects of what we were giving to the Royal Navy would be. And so did the Latin Americans, although I still don't think they quite understand the extent to which it, it did have an effect. But we certainly did, and we knew the price we would be paying in uh, what actually happened. The Argentines and all of the other Latin Americans abruptly stopped supporting uh, the efforts of the Salvadorians and the uh, Contra forces against the communists in Central America. And that led to Contragate. While Lehman's staff was helping Britain, Secretary Haig and his team were maintaining the official American posture of neutrality traveling back and forth between London and Buenos Aires. Were you aware as you were shuttling backwards and forwards trying to get a diplomatic solution that equipment and provision was already being provided by the United States to Britain? Yes. Didn't that conflict with the aim of achieving a diplomatic settlement? Well, you know, uh, not necessarily. Uh, we thought it might make the British more willing to be more flexible. Did the Argentine realize that? Oh, well, they were excusing us of doing far more than we were actually doing. But it's a curious kind of even-handedness when you're arming one side, even while saying you're even-handed. Well, I mean, we were neutral when we gave Britain 100 destroyers in World War II. That's not a very <laughs> neutral act. We were also neutral when we were firing on sight at German submarines in the North Atlantic. That's not a very neutral act. It goes back to this rather atavistic business of blood and language. I thought, I mean, just extraordinary. What an extraordinary statement from that guy. The atavistic business of blood and language. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only time in this entire documentary that the Americans have truly behaved like kind of, you know, they're actually doing the special friend thing. Weird. Really weird. In a city where Winston Churchill is regarded almost as a national hero and presides over Massachusetts Avenue, the ties with Britain are still by far the closer of the two. This has led to a great deal of unhappiness among ordinary Americans about their country's diplomatic even-handedness. Letters have been pouring into the British Embassy here, offering advice, support and even money. Well, one urged us to reduce the Argentinian Navy to an artificial reef. Uh, another urged us to sink the, sink the Bismarck, which I passed to the naval attaché. Here's a remarkable one from an ex-marine in Texas. Amphibious assault of any island happens to be my bread and butter, but in this particular case, I'm offering my services free to the UK. And in his PS to the ambassador, he says, uh, I doubt you'll need my help, but if it turns out you do, don't fail to let me know. I haven't been in a good battle since Inchon and the Chosin Reservoir. I mean, this is, isn't this just amazing? <laughs> just amazing stuff. I'm, I'm speechless listening to this. By the end of April, the task force was nearing the Falklands. It had become clear now to the American negotiators that there was no possibility of a diplomatic solution. In what was presented as a dramatic change in policy, 
Haig now announced that America would respond to British requests for material support. He and the President neatly ignored the fact that British ships were already full of weapons provided by the United States. At this moment, we've had no request for anything such help uh, <laughs> from the United Kingdom. <laughs> the capacity of politicians to just barefacedly lie is incredible, isn't it? Isn't it incredible? But I think what he was, what the Secretary was saying is we must remember that the aggression was on the part of Argentina in this dispute over the sovereignty of that little ice-cold bunch of land down there. On the morning of the 21st of May, 1982, British troops attacked the Falkland Islands at San Carlos Bay. The Argentinian forces were taken by surprise. But with Can I just say, by the way, that we've seen two absolute bare-faced lies today. Thatcher, when she denied ever following monetarism, and, uh, and the Gipper, just there. In hours, their jets were attacking the landing fleet from their bases in Argentina. Every gun and missile system aboard the British ships was brought into action against the Argentinian planes as they screamed in across the bay without warning. It was one of the biggest naval actions since World War II, and American weapons played a crucial role. No weapon was more important than the American Sidewinder missiles, which the Harrier jets had been adapted to carry. Okay. Well, they weren't just Sidewinders, they were the latest version of the Sidewinders that give, gave a wholly new capability to that heat-seeking missile. There were only the small Harriers that had no real area defense capability, and so the shots they could get at the attacking Argentines were within visual range and often oncoming shots. Well, the old Sidewinders, you have to get behind an aircraft uh, to shoot a Sidewinder. And by that time, he's dropped his bombs on the ship. The new Sidewinders, you can shoot head on. And that's what uh, the Harriers did so brilliantly and so effectively. And as a result, they forced all of the Argentines after that to fly down on the deck, which forced them to drop the bombs from very low altitudes, and, and most of them didn't fuse. So there were about 10 ships that actually had bombs in them that didn't go off because of the effectiveness of forcing them down. But the decision to give that new Sidewinder, that's not just normal relationships. That's a deliberate decision, isn't it? A deliberate decision to save Britain's bacon. Yes, de facto, definitely. It wasn't just Sidewinders, but all sorts of American weaponry that was made available to Britain during this war. Other missiles, mortar shells, high explosive ammunition, even night vision goggles and matting for the Harriers to land on. As the battle for the Falklands intensified, Britain's constant requests to the Pentagon continued to meet with a swift response. We received one particular request, which I cannot discuss in terms of what the equipment was, but it was uh, a certain type of equipment which only made sense if they were going to land. We were asked that we deliver that particular equipment within six hours. Uh, we managed to do it from our stocks to the South Atlantic. I mean, they just did everything. Just, just said yes to everything, gave them all the help they wanted because basically they wanted Britain to win the Falklands. It's kind of, what's going on here? What's the angle? The British, for use six hours later, we did it. Yeah. So it was your war? It was it America's war? No, it wasn't our war. We weren't dying out there. It's only your war if you're dying out there. So what was it to you? We were helping. We were doing what we could. We were being loyal friends. But it wasn't our war. We I mean, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? When has, when has America ever, like, throughout this entire documentary, when has America ever actually been, like, actually a friend like this? As far as I can see, they did actually behave in that way during this. I can't see any angle, really. I didn't lose people. I think America would have been in a very difficult position if Britain had looked like losing. They would have had a NATO ally and a close old friend 
being defeated by a dictatorship in the South Atlantic. And I think they would have inevitably, in some ways, have got drawn in, which they didn't want to do. Could we have done it without them? We certainly couldn't have done it in the time in which we did, or with the relatively reasonable casualties. It would have been much more costly and much more lengthy without American support. I attach enormous importance to the, the support we got from America in communications and in materials, not, of course, in men. What would have happened if the American administration had said, we're going to be strictly neutral, no more help to Britain while this thing goes on? Well, I think, uh, I think that Britain would have had to have withdrawn from the Falklands. Would have been defeated, in other words. Yes. That's my... Uh, they have been extraordinary... Considering this was 1988, right? So some of these guys were either still around or they were current, right? This only happened, like, this, this is a 1988 documentary, and this happened, like, five years earlier. I don't know if Reagan was still in or if Bush Sr. was in by this point, but Thatcher was still the prime minister at this point when this documentary was made. It is remarkable how candid they're all being. They're just like, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. My personal opinion. Anyone can speculate, but uh, from everything I know, that that is certainly my uh, my firm conclusion. Why do you conclude that? Because... Britain had let so much of her modernization and infrastructure decline during the 60s and 70s that she did not have what it took to defend herself in a, uh, a, a prolonged engagement, even against a rather primitive, though highly trained and highly motivated force like the Argentines. They were not up against uh, the Russians. But uh, the, a succession of governments had refused to put the money into the modern communications gear, the missile defenses, the sidewinders. Well, when we, we saw, based on the documentary we've just watched and the economic dire straits Britain was in, why they didn't do any of that stuff, because stuff, they were fucking broke. The, uh, the, the three-dimensional air defense radars and most stupidly they all scrapped the big aircraft carriers indeed they had sold they had the invincible class carriers on the block to australia at the very time it took place so you you just can't have it both ways you can't want to play a role as a serious power and do it on the cheap and so we made up for it we knew what we had to do britain's victory was a triumph for mrs thatcher for the time being the role of the united states remained secret a private debt to be repaid later. I must go down. Did she show signs of gratitude to the Americans for what they'd done? Uh, not effusively, no. We paid for everything we got. But I think we felt that um, we, we got what we expected to get. Because nothing was said publicly. I mean, what? She wasn't, she wasn't even that grateful. She didn't really care. And this, this is the th bit of this documentary that I don't really see, because as we'll see when we get to the Granada bit now, Thatcher continues just to be like, yeah, fuck you, basically. I, do, I don't really understand the dynamics here, because I don't understand like what Thatcher's bringing to the table, or whether she was just such a force of personality that, the Amer I mean, like, the Americans ro don't roll over for anyone, but something weird happens around this point in the relationship, which I don't understand. So it's like the Reagan administration that got sentimental or something. Uh, anyway, let's carry on. Publicly at the time about the scale of American support for Britain during the Falklands War, there was no sudden upsurge of pro-American feeling in Britain. If anything, the opposite. Anti-Americanism, which had been dormant since the Vietnam War, was stirring again. And the reason was a proposal to base a new American medium-range nuclear missile the cruise missile, here in Britain at Greenham Common. Okay, so this is the big chip, really. They want the nuclear missile in Britain. Maybe that's why. Maybe that was the deal that Thatcher did. Maybe. Originally, these weapons had been requested from the American government by the European governments. But as the time of their arrival approached, there was mounting public opposition. 
There were fears that it would make Britain a more likely target for Soviet attack, and also fears based on statements from President Reagan and others that the United States might now think it possible with these medium-range missiles to fight a nuclear war that would be confined to Europe and wouldn't damage America. And so, here at Greenham Common began the longest demonstration of anti-nuclear and anti-American feeling that Britain had ever seen. When we actually got to Greenham Common and we had decided to follow the suffragettes example and chain to the fence and make a slight... I mean, it seems like since about 1890, Britain has had an unlimited, an, an unlimited supply of women that look like this ready to, ready to protest. Can anybody explain to me why there's always such an unlimited supply of middle class white women just ready to go to pick up a placard and go to any protest? Because they're still, they're still there, basically, the, the women like this more dramatic protests than we had originally anticipated. The American base commander came out, took a look at the women sitting there and said, as far as he was concerned, we could stay there as long as we liked. And it was at that moment that we decided that's exactly what we would do. The women protesters at Greenham Common saw the US bases as a dangerous alien presence in Britain, completely outside British control. I was amongst the women when, for the very first time, we took the fence down. We took down all oh, miles and miles of it. You, you felt at that very time, as we stepped over the fence inside, you were really going onto American territory. It literally was, you know, little. What, what, why? Why is there this? I mean, why is it a lesbian female protest? I just don't understand. And why? Like, it's so, it's so weird. America there. And I found that out because on one occasion when we were arrested, um, they kept us there for many, many hours and we asked if we could have a cup of tea. And the police said, oh, sorry, we've got no American money with us, so we can't go in and get you any tea. The Greenham protesters became the focus for large-scale demonstrations in Britain and in Europe. Oh, Although yeah, they okay. were ridiculed by many of their opponents, they were taken very seriously by those in the Pentagon responsible for the deployment of crews. We had daily reports coming in. Demonstrations here, demonstrations. Can I get a check on Pearl, please? I'm sure I've seen him before, actually, this, this character. It's their demonstrations being planned. Uh, and then, of course, they were widely shown on television programs in the United States. It seemed as though everybody in Europe was, was demonstrating. There was the spectacle of the encampment at uh, Greenham Common, uh, and from time to time, encounters between the police and demonstrators. <laughs> Elections, in some cases, turned on uh, on uh, that issue, or or the opposition at least tried to make uh, make them turn on that issue. It was touch and go, and it was far from clear that deployment was going to be possible. Most worrying for the Americans was the British election, due in June 1983. A new Minister of Defence campaigned vigorously against Labour's promise to remove all US nuclear weapons and bases from Britain. We work on the basis of trust. The Americans trust us and we trust the Americans. And if you really start thinking about what the problem is, the problem is very clear. We're dealing with a monolithic Soviet power. That's where the real enemy, that's where the real threat is. And we have a total unanimity of interest and purpose with the Americans and the, West, the rest of the Western Alliance in deterring a threat from that direction. If we start distrusting each other, then I must say it looks very bad for the peace of the Western world. See, see, see the thing is, is that I understand the position, right, with the, you've got to understand, with the USSR there, they were a genuine threat. They were a nuclear threat, but they were also just a, like, the threat of communism was a genuine thing. Like, they could have, they want, you know, they wanted to expand their power, they wanted to take over. And some of these protesters, some of these lesbians that you saw and whatnot, that they weren't necessarily, I mean, some of them would be thinking about like British sovereignty or whatever, but some of them would have been commies. Some of them would have been sympathetic to the Soviet cause. And, you know, or they could have been just straight up backed by the Russians. 
So, I, I mean, I can kind of understand, like, you've got to, like, deal with the situation as it is, right? We've seen over the past six episodes the decline of British power. At this point in the 80s, it's kind of like, well, okay, you know, yeah, the Americans are foreign part power, but if they've got these cruise missiles, we probably want them to hit the Russians before they can hit us. Um so I, I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of with the government, I'm kind of with Heseltine and and the government on this, to be honest. What effect would it have had if Labour had won and the American bases had been ejected? Uh, the United States would have withdrawn its forces completely from Western Europe. Uh, it would have unraveled the alliance. Even though that first step of the United States would have been counter to the U.S. interests, still they would have done it because... If the Labour Party came in and, and pursued the platform that it was running on, you could expect other nations in Western Europe to, to shift in that direction. And the United States, I thought, would walk out with its troops. Uh, it would unravel the alliance. And I thought it would move, as a consequence of those two, I thought it would move the Soviets more quickly towards the achievement of their objective in Western Europe, which is the coercion and in intimidation, without uh, having a fire shot. Does this mean that the British government doesn't really, in your view, have that much freedom to act independently, to pursue its own policies. It has to go along with American policy. No, in it, Europe. it has to go along with NATO policy. <laughs> Margaret! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the thing is, is that at that time, you've got to, you've got to think about the mindset at the time, during the Cold War, the reality was that if you weren't part of NATO, you were liable to be taken over by the commies. So in the Cold War calculus, it kind of made sense, to be honest. Pilda Thatcher, Conservative Party candidate, 19,616. Mrs. Thatcher was returned to office with a landslide majority, attributed by many to her success in the Falklands. The relationship between the two leaders was now at its closest. Each had stood by the other in the face of opposition in their own country, a bond strengthened by mutual admiration. Their relationship was being compared to that between Macmillan and Kennedy, even Churchill and Roosevelt. And Do you think they ever got it on, by the way? I know that was like a, a long-running joke on Spitting Image. <laughs> Do, you think they, <laughs> Do you think they ever got it on, these two? <laughs> and had already acquired the status of legend among the president's staff. Well, we were at Williamsburg when the United States uh, hosted the economic summit, and um, the president was there in uh, what was really the um, the place where our uh, revolution began against uh, the mother country back 200 years before. So the president had a very carefully honed opening statement for dinner on the first evening of the summit at Williamsburg. And uh, he began by saying, um, had things turned out a bit differently 200 years ago, virtually on this very day. And before he could utter his punchline, Mrs. Thatcher took the words right out of his mouth by saying, and I would be presiding at this dinner rather than you. And uh, it was a, a really a feat in being able to read the mind of Ronald Reagan because she knew exactly what he was going to say and she snitched those words right out of his mouth. The high point of the visit was a dinner given by Mrs. Thatcher at the British Embassy. In her speech, she talked of Britain and America's need to depend on each other, as together they faced a new Cold War. She consciously adapted a phrase of her hero, Winston Churchill, oh. to make... <laughs> Still even now, the looming figure of this fat prick. Anyway, let's carry on. Her point. Soviet ideology teaches that we in the West are like ripe apples ready to fall into their laps, that all they have to do is to shake the tree. As someone else might have said, some apple, some tree. Mrs. Thatcher flew home with the praise of the American press ringing in her ears. But any glow of pleasure she may have felt at being acclaimed America's closest ally 
was soon to be dispelled and the limitations of the alliance made all too clear. Just two weeks later, on the 19th of October, the government of the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada fell in a Marxist coup. Uh, I have to say this entire episode is extremely strange. And I still, I, when I watched it earlier on, I didn't understand it. And I still, I'm going to see if it makes any more sense to me now. I'm going to really concentrate. But I just don't understand the actions of Maggie in the next five minutes or so. The State Department, fearing another Cuba, argued for an invasion and said that because American students on the island could be taken hostage, it must be done immediately. When the final decision was made by the president, it was made in the Situation Room on a rainy Monday afternoon at about six o'clock in the White House, and everybody had their say around the table. The Secretary of Defense, the Director of Central Intelligence, the Secretary of State, others and those. The room got very quiet as they all look at him, and I'm sure it was no longer than 30 seconds. But it seemed to me to be about five minutes of silence, because that's where the buck stops, as they say. And the president finally says, OK, let's go. But Grenada was a member of the Commonwealth, and the Queen was its head of state. A worried British Foreign Office, hearing rumors, had asked the Americans whether it was true they were planning to invade. Just hours before the first troops went in, the Foreign Secretary gave the House of Commons the reply he'd received from Washington. Can your foreign secretary assure us that uh, there's no question of American military intervention on the island in this situation? It only make the situation worse. Uh, there is no question of that, of which I know, sir. On the night of October 24th, 1983, we were given a lovely going away party by Princess Alexandra at the Thatched House Lodge in Richmond Park. And one of the guests was Mrs. Thatcher. And after dinner, she got an urgent telephone call from number 10 and had to leave rather swiftly. But before she went out the door, she motioned for me to come over in the corner of the room and said to me, we believe that your chaps are going into Grenada tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, she was furious. Uh, I was not called on the carpet. Someone named Ronald Reagan was on the telephone because Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan are Ron and Margaret to each other. And I was privy to some of their personal correspondence, and uh, they're very close. And that must. <laughs> that personal sex talk. Oh, Ron, I love it when you speak that way to me. Can you do that accent again? Frankly, Maggie, I don't give a damn. Can you imagine this? <laughs> There's been a sort of a hot telephone call. Get back, honey, get down! He crashed into it. Oh, my God! He crashed right there. What are they going to do now? They got a rocket launcher on that hill. Mrs. Thatcher argued uh, against it uh, to the president. I think she put her case very forcefully. And uh, she put it in her, her um, comments, I'm sure, made an impact on the president. But she would understand, as an elected head of government, better than anybody, but the final responsibility for the protection of that country's citizens rests with that person. And in that case was Ronald Reagan, not Mrs. Thatcher. And this conversation, was it a debate or a discussion, or was it Mrs. Thatcher telling the president what she As said? As I said, I didn't uh, participate in the conversation, but I'm told that uh, the majority of the talking was done by uh, Mrs. Thatcher. Grenada, America invades against Britain's advice. Thatcher warned Reagan in midnight call. They've humiliated us, Healy tells Howe in Commons uproar. The Foreign Secretary told us yesterday there was no reason to think that American military intervention was likely <laughs> and that he knew of no American intention. You see, I just don't, I don't understand the dynamics here. After all the help that the Americans gave thatcher for falklands why didn't she just like give him this i just don't understand why she's being so uh, i mean I, okay maybe the uh the involvement of the queen or, or whatever but like you know if, it, if it's you know she's against communism let the americans have this i just don't understand why uh why she didn't support this it's the least i mean she could have just said yeah cool you know do, do what you got to do I don't I don't understand the 
uh, point of taking the stance she did over, over this. It seems like particularly ungrateful given what they just done for her. Um, maybe somebody can explain this to me because I still don't get it. ...to invade. Now that is an extraordinary statement to come from a representative of government which prides itself on being America's most loyal ally. I felt very strongly that Jeffrey Howard had been very badly let down. People felt he'd misled the House. He hadn't. What he had done is given them the best information available to him. It wasn't good enough, but that wasn't his fault. Are you saying the Americans told you they weren't going to go in and then did? I think the words that I would use is there was a lapse in the good relations between the Allies. Sounds pretty much the same thing to me. Yeah, but you're a cynic. <laughs> Grenada. <laughs> we were told was a friendly island paradise for tourism. Well, it wasn't. It was a Soviet Cuban colony being readied as a major military bastion to export terror and undermine democracy. We got there just in time. There was a bitter reaction in America to Mrs. Thatcher's failure to support the president. The Wall Street Journal wrote that Grenada, under a Marxist government, was a far worse place than the Falkland Islands under Argentina. Britain was a fair-weather ally. That was one that was a bit puzzling for, for us uh, in the United States. You see, I, I, I completely understand the American perspective on this because they did Maggie a massive solid over Falklands, as we've just seen. So what the fuck is this belligerence about? And why, you know, I just don't understand why, you know, it's so like piffling and um, inconsequential as well. You know, Granada, just let them have it. Fuck it. I mean, they're America. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. So might as well just go along with it for the good of the so-called special relationship. I don't understand why, what's the point of having a tiff over this is. Women, basically. She's a woman. Thanks. Uh... It was obvious that we moved uh, very quickly on Grenada, that uh, we did not consult with uh, the uh, British government as thoroughly as we should have, but time didn't permit, and also the secrecy of the mission didn't permit. But we were a bit puzzled that Mrs. Thatcher did not uh, back the United States uh, uh, invasion a little more strongly. We are, of course, always uh, impressed with the views of the British government and Mrs. Thatcher. But that doesn't mean that we always have to agree with them. We quickly wrote it off to her necessity to deal with uh, her own internal politics. And we respected that because, after all, uh, she wouldn't be our friend very long if she wasn't re-elected. You mean she didn't really mind? She just had to appear to mind for domestic reasons? Well, uh, that's what we presumed. A week later, the British Prime Minister took the opportunity of a BBC World Service phone-in programme to dispel any doubts that she hadn't meant what she said. I think as a general rule, we in the Western countries, the Western democracies, use our force to defend our way of life. We do not use it to walk into other people's countries, independent, sovereign territories. We try to extend our beliefs not by force, but by persuasion. You mentioned oppression, communism. Yes, I hate it. There are many, many peoples in countries in the world who would love to be free of it. That doesn't mean to say that we can just walk into them and say, now you're free. What? I mean, what the fuck? Okay, all right, fair enough. Whatever. Grenada was a reminder that where America's interests and Britain's were in conflict, Britain couldn't expect any special treatment. And it was a lesson that wasn't lost on the growing number who were worried about America. I, I, I still don't understand the point of that. She could have just been like, yeah, you know. I mean, okay, the the help they gave over the Falklands was secret or whatever, but she she knew how much help they'd given them, so just return the favour. I, I don't get. I really don't get it. America having sole control of the cruise missiles that were due to arrive any day at Greenham Common. A public opinion poll taken just a week after Grenada showed that three quarters of the British people believed that if America wanted to fire those missiles and Britain objected, America would fire them anyway. Well, yeah, of course they would. Of course they would. So you might as well just go along with it. I just don't get it.
It was just before nine o'clock as the plane bringing the first cruise missiles to Britain came in to land at the end of its overnight flight across the Atlantic. The cruise arrived on the 14th of November 1983. It was one of those wonderful occurrences in our life where something was ahead of schedule. So much in advance of their date that Michael Heseltine was taken completely by surprise. He was reviewing the troops in Aldershot or could have been anywhere. I mean, they, nobody bothered to tell him. And he arrived in a flustered state and said, of course, he knew all about it all along. Of course, as he was Minister of Defence. I mean, I'm not being like Blair. I just get on board with the America. I'm just saying, of all the all the issues we've seen, of all the things, that is not what like it's just such a nothing, such a nothing episode. After they've just, you know, in my like from my point of view, the help they gave over the Falklands was probably the nicest thing America has done in eighty years, as far as I can see. Since, since we started watching this documentary and her immediate repayment is to just be is to just uh, publicly criticize them when they need the return of the favor I just don't get it, it just seems like needless but it, it could be it could be that she had such a good relationship with Reagan or whatever that she could get away with being a bit more critical I don't know like you know now like you can say things to for, you can be critical of a friend and not fall out with them. Maybe, maybe it was something like that, but it just seems odd to me. He, of course he knew what was happening. It's just the Americans had forgotten to tell him. The first sign that an announcement was imminent came when Mr. Hesseltine cut short a visit to Aldershot this morning. He planned to spend three hours with the 5th Airborne Brigade, but after half an hour, he returned to London. He held a news conference. He denied that the arrival of the missiles had caught him by surprise. The initiative for the decision for deployment uh, uh, today came from uh, me. Despite growing public pressure for some form of British control of the missiles, the government insisted that the agreed procedure for consultation with America was adequate. In practice, though, they knew that if it were to break down, Britain's opposition would in any case prove irrelevant. They've got other nuclear weapons and they have other cruise missiles. In it, it just seems bizarre to me that those, like, you know, teen, like 20-something uh, lesbian women were, were crying over this. Like, the, why do they care? Since since when do young women care about like the placement of uh, nuclear cruise missiles? Like, why do they care so much about that issue? That there there must have been some, there must be a story behind that. There must be a kind of uh, a, 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 an elite network or something behind those because that's just not the sort of issue that women care about typically. It just seems very uncharacteristic. I'd love to know more about those women in particular. Were they working for the Russians or what? It seemed, it seems like something unnatural about women caring as much about, um, you know, oh, should the British have control of these nuclear missiles? Does, doesn't pass the sniff test to me. In other parts of Europe. So if we didn't use them or didn't agree to let them use the ones here, they could have got agreement from someone else. And uh, I always took the view that in terms of the consequences, the Russians wouldn't discriminate between those countries that had used them and not used them. They would immediately say, well, the risk is that the British will be next. It's just dawned on me, America, as one day it may dawn on you, that you are just another country, just another nation in the history of the world, just another collection of fallible human beings. History has not provided you, America, with a monopoly of moral good. Based young chap. <laughs> or a special divine role in the working of history. By 1984, distrust of Britain's dependence on America was spreading. The American Secretary of Defense was worried enough to fly to Britain to argue America's case. This is mental, right? Can you imagine, right? This is the equivalent of Anthony Blinken or something going to the Oxford Union to try to, pers to try to persuade the students that America is good. What, what the fuck is he doing? This is mental.
I, I just, anyway, let's carry on. At the Oxford University Union. President, President ladies and gentlemen, Great Britain could uh, walk out of NATO tomorrow. Sorry, yes, Lloyd Austin. Okay, yeah, L- Lloyd Austin couldn't, you know, he, he doesn't have the uh, mental faculties to have a debate <laughs> like this. Uh, but but still, I just find it remarkable that he thought this was important enough to take time out to uh, have a debate with, 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 with that young twerp that we just saw. It's just like, haven't you got more important things to be doing? If you told us to uh, take our soldiers out of Great Britain, they would be gone within a day or two. American tanks would certainly not roll in the streets as the Soviet tanks have rolled in Budapest and Kabul and Prague. The point is that whether you think it is moral or not, or whether anyone else thinks it is moral or not, it is capable of being stopped and changed by the will of the people. And that... Uh, I, I, I I went to Oxford uh, Union debates a number of times, by the way. A number of times myself. Um, you know, not not my scene, really. Cannot be done in the Soviet Union. So I urge your... Uh... Concern about the consequences of Britain's military involvement with America was soon to spread to the wider issue of American investment and cause a dramatic political crisis in the British government. It began when the giant American helicopter company, Sikorsky, offered to come to the rescue of the ailing British helicopter manufacturer, Westland. What Sikorsky hoped for was a friendly takeover with the agreement of a British government known to admire America's business skills and enterprise. And before we we made this transaction, we did go to the MOD, and we did did go to the uh, the trade industry, and we asked them, would you have any uh, objections to our taking minority interest? And the answer was no. That's the support we were looking for. The Thatcher government saying, let it be a commercial deal, was a signal to you that you had a good chance of winning? Absolutely. Without that, we had no chance of winning. But not all the government was happy with the plan. Leading the opposition was Michael Heseltine, the very man who campaigned so hard for the cruise missiles. He proposed instead that Europe's helicopter companies should combine to create a rival to Sikorsky and keep... Now, this is very interesting because I increasingly find myself sympathetic to the views of Tarzan. Um, Now, this will not come as that much of a shock to long-time members of this channel who know that I voted Remain and was never really big on Brexit. I was never a Brexiteer, right? Um, And I I have come in the fullness of time to truly appreciate what Heseltine was trying to do here. And um, I think we should listen closely to what he says. The Americans out of Westland. Behind his argument was the idea that Britain's proper role was not as a junior partner of America, Listen, in the context of what we've been talking about and in the context of the kind of uh, horrible situation that we're in now, listen to what Hasseltine's saying here. Just listen carefully and really try to process what he's saying. Instead, that Europe's helicopter companies should combine to create a rival to Sikorsky and keep the Americans out of Westland. Behind his argument was the idea that Britain's proper role was not as a junior partner of America, assembling their helicopters for them, but as America's equal, and that meant joining Europe. There is no way in which a relatively small nation-state of our size can ever expect to be a partner of a superpower. We can be part of a superpower, a European one, but we could never be a partner of the United States of America. Have we been deluding ourselves that we can be? Well, we're torn, aren't we, between the need to persuade the Americans to stay here and to show solidarity with them in that endeavor, which I strongly support, and uh, 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 difficulty of finding a way of uh, securing a more cohesive European pillar within the alliance, which could give some Americans, but not all, the impression that we're trying to separate ourselves from America. I take very much the view that the stronger the European pillar, the more likely the Americans are to remain wedded to a proper partnership across the Atlantic. But the European scheme was anathema to the Prime Minister. Heseltine nevertheless pursued it. The mood in the British cabinet became increasingly acrimonious, with every twist of the argument being leaked to the press. 
Finally, at a meeting of the cabinet early in January 1986, an exasperated Heseltine decided that he could take no more. I, I don't uh, have really anything to add to what I said at the time. I've, the whole thing was thoroughly ventilated and explored. Yes, but this and, is a uh, history program. We're not doing a... Yes, but I'm not... Looking back I'm, on it. It's, it, nothing is history in, in that sense. It's all very current, my life. I have resigned from the cabinet and I will make a full... So, I mean... If we had fully pursued the policy that Heseltine was talking about here, and if Europe had been able to um, kind of fulfill some of its ambitions, right, in a more gung-ho manner uh, than, it, than, than it did, I think that we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in right now because i think if the ukraine war has shown anything to europe it is that america is not its friend the bombing of nord stream should have been a wake-up call to every single person who has an iota of national pride in europe and has an iota of pride in the idea of being european in any single way um if we'd followed the course that Hesseltine was talk talking about and actually gone for it properly, rather than in a kind of half-assed manner, which is what has actually happened, um, we wouldn't... Now we're in a situation where America can just, like, literally bomb a multi-billion dollar pipe and nobody even says a word about it across Europe. Now in a situation where we're so enthralled to the Americans that uh, we have to just sit back and watch Israel, you know, bomb the shit out of the Gazan population, and not a single European leader will say one word about it. Right. So we're basically in a situation now where we are just a hundred percent vassal to America in all single ways, and I, I just don't see that as a good as a good place to be. Um, whereas the, the course he was suggesting in time could have turned into something. That's been fucked now. It's been completely fucked. Um, so that, that's my thinking about this at the moment. Later today. The resignation of a senior cabinet minister over the issue of US investment in Britain encouraged more anti-Americanism. A week later, the Westland shareholders' meeting at the Albert Hall became a battleground for and against America, to the dismay of the Americans involved. I was pulling up in my car, and I just couldn't believe it. It looked like every entrance uh, to the Royal Albert Hall had at least 15 cameramen by it. When my car pulled up in the street, they ran out to surround the car. I couldn't even get out. And when I did, of course, all kinds of microphones were in my face. Then as I walked through, I noticed the girls were dressed in, in these banners that said, uh, vote Europe, vote against America. I think U.S. versus Europe is an important point that had to be debated, but not to the extent that it did. And as a result of that, it got out of control. Sikorsky acquired Westland, but the prime minister paid a high price. When government plans were announced to sell the motor manufacturer, British Leyland, to Ford and General Motors, the outcry forced her to back down. There was a wave of very strong anti-American sentiment, or certainly uh, a very strong wave of pro-British sentiment, uh, that uh, the British motor industry should not pass into foreign hands, and particularly into American hands. I th so, seriously, pursuing the policy, not, not pursuing Heseltine's policy, and, and the policy pursued since this moment that we're, that we're looking at right now, Every last scrap of assets of this country has been pawned off and sold off. Every last scrap. Every bit of industry, every business, every corporation, every everything. Is, the whole country has been strip mined since this moment, since this exact moment. And in the in the last 10, 15 minutes of this doc, documentary you'll see there are, there's a particular hinge point here where things could have gone a different way. 
and it was the policy not pursued and the way we've gone we are now i mean not only is the country completely sold out but like i said 100 percent american vassal and the direction that america has gone in has been a disaster as well as any american will tell you but now we all everybody everybody in europe has to you know when their ship goes down our ship's going to go down as well you know all the, all of the i mean i don't need to tell anybody watching this or every single shitty policy they've done has happened here as well down to mass immigration demographic change you know this war that war israel this israel that um you know so now we're, now all of our fates are tied to the american fate and the american fate is a fucking disaster so i i really do think that heseltine was far sighted um at this point i really do I think that that was a very powerful emotion i cannot explain why it should have risen with such force i think it was substantially irrational uh, but uh, it was undeniable in its strength, and coming as it did shortly after the Westland affair, it meant that the British government uh, took actions which frustrated what would have been, I think, uh, an understandable American commercial development. But the anti-Americanism unleashed in Britain by the Westland affair was puny compared to what followed. At the beginning of April 1986, U.S. tanker planes used for mid-air refueling were seen arriving at bases in Britain in unusual numbers. There was speculation that America was preparing to attack Libya, which the Reagan administration blamed for terrorism against Americans. Any such intention was officially denied. But a US Air Force spokesman said the extra planes are in Europe for the start of the exercise season. I was sent on the eve of the bombing of Libya, or very shortly before, to go and see the Prime Minister of Great Britain, to whom we hoped would allow us to use, uh, basically British bases, but American aircraft and American lives. But she understood that for the past 40 years we've kept 350,000 men in Europe at a cost to ourselves of $100 billion a year. And I think she feels that in the alliance everybody must make some contribution and that this was one of the forms of Britain's contribution. At the end of it, I said, uh, just to make conversation, I said, you know, Prime Minister, my normal job is the United States representative to the United Nations. And when I go back there, I'm going into the eye of the storm. And she said, General, when I go back to the British electorate, I'm going into the eye of the storm. This morning, the United States launched an attack on military targets in Libya. Some of the F-111s involved in the mission left from bases in Britain with the full permission of the Prime Minister. Mrs. Thatcher had obviously many questions uh, and concerns uh, and uh, they were expressed and uh, the response was made to them and permission was given to do what was done. Uh, we will have very full reports of the attack as the F-111s return to their bases uh, in the early morning and uh, we will have uh, more precise uh, bomb damage uh, uh, assessments at that time. The Americans' intended target was possibly the Central Security Headquarters. They missed. Instead, a medical clinic and ordinary flats and houses took the hit. The number of casualties is not at all clear. On the streets of London, protests erupted on a scale not seen since Vietnam. The Prime Minister was accused of involving Britain in a dangerous and possibly illegal act of war, a raid that Britain's European allies had refused to participate in. And the protests now began to include people who'd never questioned Britain's involvement with the United States. The staunchly conservative villages around the US base at Upper Hayford had accepted the American presence here for 40 years. But it was from Upper Hayford that many of the F-111s left for Libya. The villagers organized a petition and marched to present it to the base commander. They found that as in Britain as a whole, two-thirds of local residents oppose this use of the base. I would like to stress that it is not an anti-American petition. It is dealing solely with the issue of the American bombing of Libya. And I was absolutely furious that the Americans had done what I thought then and still do think was a totally illegal act. And I was furious that Mrs. Thatcher is a... Probably the poshest name ever 
Karen Fairfax Chomley. <laughs> Hello, Karen Fairfax Chomley. Allowed them to use the launch the, the planes from England. Wherever I'd lived, I would have been against the action. But it was the hearing the aeroplanes go over and then hearing that those planes had been making the raid that made me get out of my usual posture of the armchair objector. I felt then, and I still feel to some extent, that the Americans are cocooned from the arenas of war, if you like, because they have great oceans around them. And that perhaps, therefore, the way in which they look at turmoil in other parts of the world is different from the way that we in Western Europe look at it. Later downtown, a Texas group honored the people who helped the United States confront Libya last week. The Texas Great Britain Commission for the Sesquicentennial said thanks to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and the people of Great Britain for standing with the United States. We wanted a people-to-people -people exchange. I mean, the people of the United Kingdom did not, did not stand with, with uh, Maggie on this one, I don't think. To let the people know in Britain how the people of Texas felt. I think that what Margaret Thatcher did in joining with us deserves our praise. I think that what... I'll just mention uh, that something I mentioned on Twitter. Have you noticed the very nasal quality of Ed Cox's voice here? And Milton Friedman has the exact same very nasal quality to the voice. Can't help but notice uh, that they have that in common. I don't know if it's like a kind of New York Jewish thing or what, but uh, something about that nasal accent, isn't it? The French did in opposing us and exposing our flyers to additional hazards deserves contempt. It didn't look quite so simple from Downing Street. Only three months before, the Prime Minister herself had stated publicly that she believed it would be wrong to attack Libya. Her ministers wondered now whether in supporting America, they'd stretched the public's loyalty too far. I think there was a general feeling, not merely among ministers, I would have thought among Conservative members of Parliament as well, that the Americans had um, really pushed us to the edge in uh, using the basis for the bombing raid upon Libya you had set off anti-Americanism on a scale quite, quite different from what was represented by the existence of cruise missiles. The United States is our greatest ally. It is the foundation of the alliance which has preserved our security and peace for more than a generation. She gave us unstinting help when we needed it in the South Atlantic four years ago. There's a widespread attitude in Europe that the Americans are somewhat naive and ingenuous and tend to shoot from the hip. And that really they're not a people with historical perspective. Absolutely 100% true. And therefore they can't see the ultimate consequences of some of their actions. Absolutely 100% true. Now my reaction to that is when we, with our naive and ingenuous ways, had nothing to do with running the world, you, the wiser and the older people, the British, the French and the others, arrange for a 21-year peace period between World War I and World War II, since we, naive, ingenuous, and without historical perspective, have had some part in world affairs. We've had 44 years of peace. So, I Well, I mean, it's been 79 years of peace now, and look at the fucking state of Europe. So thanks a lot for that. I mean, maybe, maybe peace is not as all as cracked up to be, I would, I would argue. Well, anyway, let's carry on. I'm not as utterly convinced of our naivete in these matters as some of our European friends. On the 4th of July, 1986, America once again celebrated her independence from Britain. A reminder to her friends and her enemies that she was the most powerful nation on earth. A title Britain had claimed only 70 years before. But changes were already happening which would alter the way America looked at the world. Back in 1916, Britain had been forced to borrow from the United States to pay for her armaments in World War I. It had made America rich, but was a symptom of Britain's decline. Now, on the eve of these celebrations, it was revealed that America had in turn taken the same step, borrowing on a huge scale from abroad 
to maintain her role as a superpower. It made Americans ask whether they were now taking on too much. There's a whole current of people here who say, why do the 290 million Europeans need us to defend them against 264 million Soviets? Now, that's something... This is very pivotal now, what's coming up, because, of course, we couldn't have... They couldn't have known, and nobody in Europe could have known back then that the USSR was about to fall, okay? The USSR is... They, they didn't know that back then, so the calculus is different. But if only they had... So many things could have turned out differently. Let's, let's just consider what he's about to say here. They are among the most... Europe is today the largest industrial infrastructure in the world. It is the largest pool of skilled labor in the world. Why should we spend this kind of money to defend them? We're not through. Are you going to meet, are you going to meet again, sir? Yes. This afternoon? In November of that same year, there was another shock. At his meeting with the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, in Reykjavik, President Reagan revealed that he'd very nearly reached agreement on eliminating all nuclear weapons from the world. The British Prime Minister, who had not been consulted, hurried to Washington to express her hostility to any such proposal. She feared that it would put Europe's security at risk and undermine Britain's own nuclear defense. Mrs. Thatcher was clearly shaken by what appeared to be the prospect of an agreement that would eliminate nuclear weapons or even uh, significantly eliminate categories of nuclear weapons. She was alarmed because you had a combination of things that seemed mutually reinforcing. Uh, the zero option for intermediate weapons in Europe, the president's statements about a world without nuclear weapons, the reports out of Reykjavik that we had come very close to an agreement eliminating nuclear weapons. And when you put that all together, it is not surprising that she was alarmed. I'd have been alarmed in her position. Mrs. Thatcher's reaction to President Reagan's desire for a nuclear-free world was to remind him of the dangers she believed Europe and America still faced. On a visit to the Berlin Wall, she emphasized that in her view, the real threat had not changed. The frontier of freedom here is our frontier. It's America's frontier as well as Germany's frontier. And we're never going to be picked off one by one. And we're going to have a sure enough defense to deter anyone who wanted to cross that wall. Every November, in towns across America, the veterans of America's foreign wars gather to honor their dead. They remember the thousands of Americans buried far from home, many of them killed, fighting for the freedom of Britain. But two weeks after these ceremonies in November 1987, a treaty was signed which, it was hoped, would make it less likely that American blood would ever again be shed for Europe. America and Russia agreed on the withdrawal of all intermediate nuclear missiles from Europe. And both sides said this was only a beginning. Ever since the end of the Second World War, Britain and America have been bound together by the fear of Russia. Britain has relied very heavily on America for her defense. The United States has looked to Britain to be a trusty ally and a safe base. But if America starts to think that the threat from Russia is receding, then her need for Britain will diminish. And if that happens, Britain will have to reconsider her future. I mean, this could explain, by the way, what he just said. That could explain why the British government, even to this day, is still so insane in its anti-Russian rah-rahism. Because maybe there's a calculus where you go, well, this is, if Britain can keep Russia there as a big threat, it maintains its own relevance in the quote-unquote special relationship. I mean, it's, you know, completely homosexual way of thinking in my view, but, uh, you know, maybe that's the calculus there. Maybe that's why, one of the reasons why the British government is such a, so yappy um, when it comes to that conflict. With Reykjavik, 
Mrs. Thatcher learnt a lesson that Winston Churchill had learnt 40 years before towards the end of the war. That however close a president and a prime minister may be, the moment comes when the United States, in its own interests, talks directly to Russia about the future of Europe. Superpower to superpower. See, what's interesting now, though, if we fast forward to today, is that Washington no longer speaks to Moscow. They don't even speak to Putin anymore. So Russia and America don't meet about the future of Europe anymore because they don't, they don't even talk anymore, which is an interesting development. And at that point, the political reality is clear. However close their two peoples may be, Britain and America discover that the Atlantic is once again an ocean that keeps them apart. So, I mean, what particularly interests me is that there's a moment there, um, especially when the jowly, the jowly guy was talking, when he said, you know, well, if you don't want us there, we'll just go home then, just take the troops out. It seems like there, is a, there was a moment where that was being thought about in, 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 the, in, the, in the late 80s there. And given that the Cold War was about to end, Gorbachev was there and the end of the Soviet Union was on the horizon, there was a moment where America could have left Europe. And there was a moment where things could have gone in a different way to how they've gone since uh, 1990, basically. Because let's face it, I mean, if things just stayed as they were let's say at that point things wouldn't be so bad but that's not what's happened that is not what's happened in the 30 years since this documentary was made and things have deteriorated significantly all across europe in this country and in america itself because they have they have opted for you know this basically suicidal path that they're on at the moment um so I do wonder about that road not taken at that point. Anyway. Okay. Um, one more super chat from Matt Bell here. He says, Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson did a show on the Falklands on Radio Albion search for Britain's misrepresentation of the Falklands War, Ton 0908-21. So that sounds uh, that sounds good. Um, well, I'm not saying imagine if World War I never happened. What I'm saying is at, the, at this point in history, in, in uh, 1988, 1990, you know, this kind of period, there was a, a prospect of America, and they were seriously thinking about and talking about on both sides of the, of the pond, they were talking about American withdrawal from, from Europe. And, you know, the Cold War was over. It's, it's something that Thomas 7 7 asks all the time. What is NATO for after the Cold War? Soviet Union's gone. Communist threat is gone. All of the things that kept that infrastructure and the whole alliance together was gone. So America could have, I mean, 350,000 troops. America had in you in Europe and if you check they still have a massive military presence here I mean, what I'm saying is is that from this moment onwards is only like 30 years ago could have could have had a very different uh could have gone a very different way uh you know unfortunately what we've got is now what we call the gay which has become a horrible monster I would say you know, the the nature of the Americans, as we've seen in this documentary, I mean, yeah, they were underhanded and, you know, they perceive their own interests and so on and so forth. But it wasn't like un, un, um, intolerable as it is now. Now, this, what has grown from this has become irredeemably toxic in my, in my view. So... All right, I will. Uh, I will. Uh, if I get time, I will try to check out the um, uh, the Matthew or Matthew Raphael Johnson show on the Falklands. 
hope you enjoyed this. Um, you do uh, check out AA Mellow, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And um, I will uh, see you next week. Uh, I mean, I, AA Mellow is on every single morning. But on this channel, I will be back on Monday next week for Cigar Stream. Do buy my courses, join the channel, but most importantly of all, ladies and gentlemen, get out. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here! Well, that's easily fixed.